So, oh, that's it's going. Uh, how we can get rid of this? Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, it's so good to have some young people around. You know how to. Okay. Ah, they're still over there. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. So we are uh, happy to have uh, Andrea Storm. We are happy that he is now LT. And uh, I'm grateful for him that he made a special effort to talk today. Um, some of to keep the line of, of the lectures uh, as planned. And he will talk about applications of bounded generation to Ulam stability. Um, I just uh, remind you that it will be, that it's kind of an analogous to the lecture we had last week by uh, Michael Chapman, who, who showed the application of bounded generation to permutation stability. So we'll see the connection and the differences. Uh, Andreas, the stage is yours. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. And you made a very specific request. I mean, uh, to you asked me to speak about this paper, which is which is by now quite quite old. And I think it. Uh, I mean, first of all, I couldn't do it uh, 14 days ago. And uh, I I thank you. I mean, for to those that sent me wishes for speedy recovery. So I'm grateful for that. It worked out. But uh, the downside is that that uh, probably in the talk of Michael Chapman that I, I couldn't attend last week, uh, a lot of the details and a lot of the ideas have already been mentioned. So I think I have to be brief at some points and some points will be just repeating what was already said. But I think there will be enough things that are slightly different in the unitary context as opposed to the permutation context. So there will also be um, some new things. And so what I want to speak about is this general uh, topic of, of ULAM stability. And I think that the idea of, of stability has been mentioned last time, but I will anyway repeat it in the special context of unitary representations uh, um, at the moment. Right, so let uh, gamma be a uh, coup. Then, then we know what a unitary representation is. The unitary representation is a homomorphism in the unitary group uh, on a Hilbert space. So let H be a Hilbert space. Um, so, uh, so unitary representation is just a homomorphism. And what I'm interested in um, is, is maps from gamma uh, to uh, U of H. So this is just a map of sets is called sorry it's a real Hilbert space or a complex Hilbert space uh, for the moment it doesn't really matter but I think I will be mostly interested in complex Hilbert spaces but um, uh, I, I mean on the top of I, I wouldn't know of any point where that was actually used no but uh, good point okay thank you yeah this is called an epsilon uh, representation Uh, of gamma uh, if um, the supremum over G and H of the norm of pi of G pi of H minus pi of GH uh, is less than epsilon. Right, so if it's really a homomorphism, then of course the supremum would be equal to zero. That these are epsilon representations for any epsilon. Um, <clears throat> and well, maybe there are some maps which are just epsilon representations for some positive epsilon, but not not for all epsilon. Right, so maybe this is actually not quite a homomorphism, but only in some sense almost a homomorphism. And the natural question in this context that goes back to to Ulam in in uh, his famous collection of problems is question, well, I mean, I would say inspired by Ulam, but let's just attribute it to Ulam for, for the moment, is any 
epsilon representation in this sense uniformly flows to a unitary representation of the group gamma. And by uniformly close, I mean, uh, I mean more formally, there exists a mu, a homomorphism from gamma into the same Hilbert space. This is a homomorphism into the unitary group over the same Hilbert space, such that um, the supremum over all G mu of G minus pi of G um, is less than delta. And so the quantifiers, uh, I mean, the right order of quantifiers would be um, that for all delta, there exists an epsilon so that for all pi, which are epsilon representations, there exists a mu such that it's actually a homomorphism, which is delta close. So these are, this is like the formal way of saying this so it's some sort of a type of um, continuity property um, in terms, I mean, in, in these typical forms of um, epsilon delta uh, formulation. Right, and so we make this, uh, if we make this a little bit more formal, uh, we can, I mean, we will study in the, in the lecture um, also a little bit this quantitative uh, dependence of delta uh, on epsilon. Um, and then we will see how, um, I mean, what kind of invariant is it that you get? So, right, I mean, that's first of all the question. And um, so the general answer in that context is that uh, answer uh, is yes, if gamma is amenable. And this is a result of Kashtan from 82, and uh, the answer is no, if the free group of two generators is a subgroup of gamma. And um, this is, um, I mean, I'm not quite sure, but it's, I think it's definitely observed in our paper, maybe it was actually observed before. Um, and it's, it's not so complicated, I mean, in comparison to Kashtan's result. But it, it, it leaves you somehow in, in the world where you have like um, somehow this, this well dichotomy that appears uh, in, in other places too, that you, you, you know the answer if the group is amenable and you know it if it contains the free group on two generators, um, but it's not so clear what happens in between. So is it really depending on containment of an actual free group or is it some property that is really um, just typical for all non-amenable groups that the answer is no. Um, yes. yes? Uh, the free group, I think you need uh, the free group to be a quotient of gamma, no, for this method. No, no, it's enough to have it um, as a subgroup. Uh, because Why is SL3Z stable? Uh, well, it's only stable for finite dimensional representations. Uh, 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 so, so far, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this, uh, the, the situation I have in on H. I'm only talking about, uh, I mean, I'm talking about general Hilbert spaces. But, uh, but it's an excellent point <laughs> because uh, the story that I'm telling, it becomes quite different if you restrict attention to finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. And if you restrict the whole study uh, of this uh, of this question of Ulam to finite dimensional epsilon representations, right? I believe that. Uh, in sorry, your, in so your paper, Andreas, yeah. I, I believe that in your paper you call it a strong Ulam stability if it holds for every Hilbert space, and you call it Ulam stability if it's only with respect to finite dimensional. That's exactly right, and so I. I haven't, so during my talk now, I haven't called anything, anything else. So I, I'm still free to use exactly the conventions that we used in the paper. So let's, let's make a definition following. Uh, uh, sorry, just one quick question. So yes. is there an explicit example of a solvable group gamma such as the answer is no? A solvable group? I mean, any solvable group is amenable. Uh, so, 
Okay. Yes. Yeah. The answer is always okay. it. Yeah. So I mean, the, 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 the groups for which we don't know, they, they, are, they are in this, this strange intermediate world between not containing the free group, but still uh, being non-amenable. Right, so there are, there are examples like these Burnside groups has been very complicated to prove that they are non-amenable, um, but we, uh, I mean, they definitely don't contain a free subgroup. And, and for such groups, it's typically very complicated to answer these questions. So in fact, I don't think this question has been answered for the Burnside group. Is it yes or is it no? Yeah, Maria okay. is, uh, uh, study, has studied. No, no, it's not, it's not clear. So, Maria was supposed to study this question, the PhD thesis, but it was kind of, it's turned out to be a very complicated question. So we, um, right. Does it answer the questions for now? Are there more questions? Oh, uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Okay. All right. So following Alex's suggestion, we make a definition we call gamma strongly ulam stable by definition, if the answer is yes, right? So any, so it's strongly Ulam stable. Whenever it's true that any epsilon representation is close to an actual representation uniformly, right? So the only way to construct an epsilon representation would be to take a representation and to make some uniform perturbation. That's always possible, right? So these are the, the cheap ones to get, right? So uh, and the question is, are there only these obvious ones? Um, and so that's only the first part of the definition. And the second part is we call gamma ulam stable uh, by definition, if the answer is yes for finite dimensional representations. Yeah, but um, so there's this epsilon delta dependence that that comes up in this uh, uh, in this talk. This should be uniform, basically, over all the possible finite dimensions, right? So that's, I mean, there would in principle be an even weaker notion. I don't know, weakly Ulam stable, if you would have it, if you would have yes for any particular finite dimension, right? So you can also study that property. I mean, you can study all kinds of properties. So we have on we have singled out these two properties and um, right. I mean, we can also fi um, find examples of this even weaker form of Ulam stability where you ha would have the answer yes for any particular finite dimension or uh, for any particular finite dimension. Maybe I will say even say something about this uh, towards the end. Right, so this strong form of Ulam stability that might coincide with amenability. So we have no examples where it's actually different from amenability. And we know that amenability implies this strong form of Ulam stability, but the other direction, it's not known. But if we have a stronger form of non-amenability like containing a free subgroup, then we also know it's not strongly Ulam stable. So that's the situation, but there might be some groups in between where it's kind of, where it's unclear. All right, and, and now what about this Ulam stability where you just look at uh, finite dimensional representations? Of course, you're, you're basically entering a, a, a different uh, territory because maybe there are groups that do not at all have any finite dimensional representations, right? So you enter kind of a slightly different um, territory where for some reason, maybe the uh, the set of finite dimensional representation is very restricted. And for that reason, already you have some problems. Um, and one of the main results that I, um, uh, that was in this paper from, from 2010 is the following theorem. Uh, let me say it very simply. So the group SLNZ uh, is Ulam stable. for n greater equal than three. Um, and in fact, for n equal two, it is not Ulam stable as one can see. So for n equal two, it really behaves like a free group. And for, well, for a free group, you already have uh, like uh, this non Ulam phenomenon in finite dimensions if, if one thinks about it, but for, for n 
at least three, um, you get this um, Ulam stability. And uh, as was uh, noted by, by Michael already, uh, these groups are not strongly Ulam stable because they obviously contain a, a, free, a free subgroup, right? So there's something happening in infinite dimensions that, that you can't see in finite, you cannot approximate in finite dimensions somehow, at least in finite dimensions, this stability phenomenon is completely different. All right, so this is this is one one theorem, and uh, maybe the uh, uh, I would say the most interesting one in that paper. But <clears throat> there was also, I mean, there are some things also about this strong Ulam stability, which is which I find um, quite interesting because you you somehow you get a numerical invariant uh, for any group by studying this strong Ulam stability or the, uh, if you want the failure of it. And I want to define this, this before I go to this uh, question of Ulam stability, I want to uh, say a few words about this numerical invariant. And so um, the numerical invariant is exactly measuring um, this dependence that I have mentioned here of uh, epsilon and delta, how they depend on each other. And so let me uh, give you the definition. So we, we define, um, F, sorry, we define F uh, gamma of epsilon to be the supremum um, of, um, let's call it uh, for the moment, I will define it in a minute, d mu um, for, for mu and epsilon representation of gamma. And we also assume that mu of the neutral element is the identity, right? So that's not automatic, but it's, um, it's not a big restriction. And what is this d mu? D uh, mu, this is the infimum. It's basically the distance of mu to the to the next honest representation. So it's the infimum of uh, the distance of mu to uh, mu, where mu is actually a homomorphism from gamma into u of h. Right. So a priori, all, all everything also depends on h. But let's just take h to be a standard infinite dimensional separable Hilbert space, and then. So that's that's fixed for all, once and for all. So this um, so this this mu minus nu. Um, well, that's just by definition the supremum over g of the operator norm mu of g minus nu of g. So that's really the supremum distance of mu to nu. So it just measures the distance. And so what I'm exactly saying is um, so that uh, by also that's that's sort of just uh, a reformulation. Uh, gamma is strongly Ulam stable um, if and only if the limit as epsilon tends to zero of f gamma epsilon is equal to zero. So you can approach zero from, from above, right, 10 epsilon to zero. And, and you want that to be zero. So that's exactly saying that for any epsilon there exists, uh, sorry, for any delta there exists an epsilon so that after all, um, you are less than delta, right? So that's, uh, that's very easy. So that's just a, um, a formulation, reformulation of the definition. And so in particular, you can now look at, uh, look at something else. You can say that, um, um, if gamma is uh, any group, um, you define f of gamma to be the limb soup as epsilon tends to zero uh, of this f gamma epsilon. So that's now a number in, well, a positive, non negative real number. Um, and that's an invariant of the group, right? So you just defined it. 
um, and it's invariant. Uh, it's an invariant of the group. But uh, basically, we can now phrase um, a, a few um, results that I have already mentioned, just in terms of this invariant. Okay. For example, yes. Sorry, it's just the limit, right? It's not limit. It's still, right? It's yeah, exactly. Limit. So it's actually if I formulated this way, it's it's actually a limit because this is a, a decreasing function. Yeah, it's actually a limit. You're right. Thanks. Um, all right. So, so what do we know? Uh, um, so, what we know is that the free group, uh, so that this number is zero if gamma is amenable. Um, we can do a concrete computation for the free group on two generators uh, to prove it's actually two. Uh, and if you think about it, two is the maximum number. It, um, is that correct? Yeah, I think two is the maximum number just because it's a difference of two unitary. So the norm cannot be bigger than two. But for the free group on two generators, it's exactly two. And uh, so that's the one first result, second result, third result. And for the last result, uh, we only have a, a lower bound that I'm, I'm sure can be improved, but in the paper we proved that um, if the free group on two generators is a subgroup of gamma, then uh, the invariant is actually lower bounded by square root of three divided by 16. So it's some strange number and I'm sure you can uh, improve um, the methods that we are using so that you get a better bound, but I'm actually not sure that that you can get two uh, as as a bound. So I'm I'm yeah that would be that would I think be be quite kind of quite interesting if you could actually get two. So in any case, this is um, some numerical invariant that interpolates between amenability and containing a free subgroup or actually being a free group, and it. Uh, a priori can take values in the interval from zero to two. Uh, and, and we don't quite know whether it can take any value different from zero and two. So it might be that uh, actually that's the only two values, right? And then it would be a, a kind of a, a kind of stupid invariant because it only detects basically strong, I mean, a strong uh, stability, strong Ulam stability or not strong Ulam stability by assigning one of the two values. But what would be much more interesting in some sense would be if there, would, if there are values in between that, that, that you can also take. So then it would be a numerical invariant that kind of gives you like a coordinate in this strange space of groups which are non-amenable but do not contain a free subgroup. And so, so that it's, a, it's a potential candidate of, of also shedding some light onto this strange mysterious world of groups and i just want to mention uh also because maria is in the in the audience some joint work that we did Andrea, we defined the uh, yes yeah, and, and i think uh, i have a vague memory that in the paper of Kishdan at the very end he gave explicit number for the surface group he said that it's not stable and maybe yes. what he says there imply that the F gamma is at least one over 10 or one over 12. I vaguely remember that there was such a... Yes, uh -huh. a so I, yeah, that, that, that might be true that he gave a, a better lower bound for surface groups because for surface groups, they are very explicit, um, uniformly bounded, uh, sorry, very explicit epsilon representations, which are not close to actual representations. And he did a very precise computation. Yes, mm -hmm. that's true. Oh. So, so if the group is the surface group, maybe there is a better bound, but I'm not sure you can get it equal to two. Uh, no, uh, no. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, maybe, maybe uh, uh, let me mention and ask you a question here. There is another kind of an invariant here that you can ask here. Assume the group is stable, and yes. then what is the connection between epsilon and delta? In all the results I know about the Ulam stability, it's always linear. That's uh, true. I mean, at least it's 
On the other hand, a Michael Chapman uh, showed that in permutation representations, I believe you can get in a different context, but you can get something which is not linear. But oh, really? this, mm -hmm. uh, do in you the know? Pointwise, in the pointwise scenar scenario, you have all these results by uh, Jonathan and Oren, where they show explicitly that you get something right. which so is stable, so but a, not a, in a linear way. Graphic or something like that. But somehow in all the results which I saw and about, about this Ulam stability or uh, uh, it's always linear, but I, I guess it's difficult to believe that this is the case. It's probably just the yeah. late examples. Uh, can you, I mean, you what is, um, so I can actually, this, this theorem of Kashtan, so he didn't, I, I don't think, he made it that precise. I'm not actually sure. Maybe he did. So if, if gamma is amenable, what he showed is that delta divided by two is a lower bound of F gamma. Now, now I'm writing delta, which is not what I wanted, epsilon. Yeah. And this is less than epsilon plus, I think, 120 epsilon square. And this is true for all epsilon less than one divided by 10. So certainly the limit is zero as epsilon tends to zero. And as Alex said, there's kind of a linear behavior, but it's, I mean, so it's not so clear whether there's, uh, it's exactly linear, right? So is, whether there's like a derivative at, at zero, or maybe does that follow from monotonicity? Maybe it actually, um, yeah, I'm not so sure. Maybe there is actually a, a, a tangent, um, but nobody has computed it, and it's it's unclear whether the the the, the slope is basically all, always the same for all the amenable groups. So maybe that's actually maybe this kind of secondary invariant is then an interesting invariant for amenable groups, right? But I mean, typically very hard to compute. All right. What but I want your to... yes for the SLNZ. Can you can you compute this f gamma epsilon? For the S, L, and Z, as in your theorem, can you compute that? Um, I have to check my own paper whether we did give a computation of this. I mean, a, a, an honest computation. Um, yes, we give a computation, and we also give a lower and a, a, a lower and upper bound, which is linear, but it's not not so explicit as the one here. So with a constant, that's that we don't compute. But that would be for the similar, similar function. I mean, but I, it, it's a, maybe a good moment to, to state this. Um, if gamma is equal to L N uh, Z and greater than zero, then there is this corresponding uh, function, which only applies to finite dimensional representations. And what is true is that epsilon divided by two is less than F gamma finite dimensional epsilon is less than a constant, which I think also depends on n times epsilon, right? And this is the same function, but restricted to finite dimensional representations, all right? Okay, thank you. But without FD, that's zero, right? So, uh, um, well, no, without, uh, without FD, there's a lower bound, which I mean, I can only, uh -huh. I mean, this, I, it's, it's, it's lower bounded by, by this number, for example. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, but thanks. maybe one can get a better lower bound if one looks at specific constructions. But that would yeah. be it. All right. Okay. Um, so there's another question in this context, which arises naturally, which is the following. So suppose you have this uh, pi is an epsilon representation. And suppose your group um, is, um, for example, uh, Ulam stable or strongly Ulam stable. So that would mean there exists mu an actual representation so that mu is close to pi. 
But then the question is, in what sense is this mu actually unique, right? Suppose you get another one. Suppose you have, uh, suppose there also exists mu prime, so that mu prime is close to pi. Then the only thing that you can uh, conclude about these two unitary representations is that mu is now close to mu prime. Yeah, I mean, that's trivial, right? They are both close to pi, so they are close to each other, uniformly close. But what does that mean? I mean, a unitary representation. So typically, we, we would say uh, a unitary representation it should be unique up to conjugation, for example, right? That's the natural form of, uh, of being the same. And if two unitary representations are close to each other, then the, the, the most natural reason for this to happen would be that they are conjugate by a unitary that is actually close to the identity, right? That's the natural source of unitary representations, of pairs of unitary representations that are close to each other, right? Pairs that are conjugate by a unitary, which is actually close to the identity, right? Then they are obviously close to each other. And that maybe that's the only source and maybe not. And that's again, a form of stability or rigidity of unitary representations that we are coming into. And we, we say, and, and that has been studied, um, I mean, in many different situations. So I think one important result that you, um, no is probably, but that's that's even in the local context, is that if a group has property T, then finite dimensional representations are rigid in this sense. So if they are too close, then they are actually conjugate. But here the setting is slightly different. So first of all, we have infinite dimensional representations, right? So that makes it more complicated. And then we also want them to be uniformly close. So that's a stronger, uh, uh, in fact, a stronger, assumption right but it's it's in general unclear what exactly uh, happens so let's let me say let me tell you the definition now we say that gamma is deformation rigid if uh, uniformly close unitary representations are conjugate by unitaries close to the identity element or close to the identity operator on the Hilbert space. Right, again, if, if you make that precise, you have to say, well, for all Delta, there exists an epsilon, so that all unitary representations that are epsilon close are actually conjugate by a unitary that's only delta away from the identity. So that's the precise way of saying it. And again, you could extract a numerical invariant uh, for this. So all right. Here you talk all the time about the distance by the operator norm and a uniformly over all the elements of the group gamma, right? Right. If I'm saying uniformly, I'm always saying uniformly over the entire group. And implicitly, I'm always talking about the unitary, uh, the, the, the operator norm on operators on the Hilbert space, if I'm saying close. Yeah, maybe I should have said this. No, it's okay. I just want to stress it because some of the loyal audience who the people who were with us the last year, the last year when we talked about uh, stability, really should be aware that there is a difference here between what we are talking now and what we talked last year. Yes. And we study the non-uniform stability, the, the, which is really uh, a yeah. stability is called sometimes, and so I think should not be mixed with each other. Anyway, if there are any questions, please interrupt me. So, just to make sure I understand, uh, you said that Rapinchuk's result implies that a property T group is the formation rigid in finite dimensions, like with respect to finite dimensional representations. Um, I think even locally, you just need that the generators are close, then 
then you look at the Hilbert Schmidt operators and you get an almost invariant vector and that will be an intertwiner of the representations. So I think it's a, it's a. Okay, thank you. Is it, uh, oh, let me ask you, uh, uh, is this deformation rigid means that the, the, the failed topology is discrete on the irreducible representations of this? Um, does it mean, no, 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 I don't, I mean, this compatible with the uniform flows is a very, very strong requirement. So it's, it's much, much stronger than saying that you have a sequence of representations that con converge in the, in the felt topology. So in the felt topology, I mean, you, first of all, you don't have to act on the same Hilbert space, but even if you do, it's, it's only pointwise in the strong operator norm or something that that you need to converge so you don't have to have uniformly in the operator norm that's a much much stronger stronger no, form so, of convergence. so this is strong you know that's what i'm saying whether well, this is a stronger statement than saying that that no, no, because the is... topology restricted to the uh, equivalent classes of irreducible yeah yeah but let me give you an example so if you uh, if you take the group of integers, then this is deformation rigid. Because if you look at two characters, they are never uniformly close to each other because it's uniformly over the entire group. And still the unitary dual is not this. Ah. So, so that's what I said. So, so having having two representations uniformly close is a very, very strong requirement. Uh, nevertheless, um, um, so there are examples. So, uh, so example, it's a very concrete example, in fact, by Pitlick and uh, Schwartz, uh, that F2 is not deformation rigid. There, so their construction it gives a deformation of the left regular representation inside the uh, space of unitary representations and it's this deformation is continuous in this uniform distance uh, on the unitaries in the operator norm uniformly over the entire group but still these representations are not conjugate to the to the left regular representation yeah so that's uh, that's one example so again the free group is like a bad guy um, and uh, there's a theorem by Johnson, so the Banach algebra uh, Johnson, who proved that if gamma is amenable, uh, then gamma is deformation rigid. Okay, <clears throat> and that's um, um, and it, it's a, it's an application of. Of amenability, so in, in some sense, um, yeah, you need to find uh, some fixed point in a convex set, and this 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 fixed point will be the intertwiner between the two representations. So you have to prove it in the right way. But this is how amenability is implied, uh, how amenability is applied. That you, um, I think you you, prop, I mean, what I remember is that you look at uh, if if you have uh, pi minus mu two representations less than epsilon then you look at something like pi of g mu of g star so something like this and the convex hull and on this you have a natural uh, action by gamma because you can on the left act by pi and on the right you act by mu star and any fixed point of that action will be some operator. And if you check the properties that it has, it's exactly an intertwiner between pi and mu. So that's that's the, the, the rough uh, strategy, how you prove this deformation rigidity. It's not all that complicated once you have the right tools um, available, um, but it's very special for amenable groups. So it's it's very hard to, um, to generalize this to other groups. So we, we proved it for unitarizable groups, but I don't want to give the definition. And anyway, there's no example of a group which is not amenable and unitarizable. So it's only slightly more general than, than Johnson's result. 
All right. So, any yeah. more questions? Yes. Um, what I think I am missing here, or maybe you explained it, is uh -huh. why uh, you started considering the formation rigidity, um, like if you were motivated by Ulam stability. Like you said that if uh, almost representation has two candidates close to it, then they, assuming rigidity, they should be conjugate. So yeah. I'm just interested why why you started considering this too. Well, I, I mean, it could be motivation enough to ask uh, if you have an epsilon representation, is there a unitary representation? And second question, is it unique up to something natural, right? And and it, of course, it's unique up to being close, right? Because they are close. But is it unique up to unitary conjugation by a unitary close to the identity? That seems like a natural, like secondary question. So once you ask existence, then you ask uniqueness. So that's, I, I think, quite natural. I see. Thank but you. In, in fact, you are completely right. I will now use this deformation rigidity um, in, in the proof. And I just took that as the motivation to introduce it. So maybe you, you are basically knowing the proof already so well that you <laughs> kind of see that I'm cheating a bit uh, when I take that as the motivation. So I see that I have like 15 more minutes and I still, I mean, I want to prove, at least give you the indication of how to prove this main result about SL3 or SLN, SLNZ. And so let me now come to this point and uh, um, let's see how, how far we get. You have 30 minutes. We have half an hour. Yeah. <laughs> Not 15, you said 15, you have 30 because we go slowly and uh, we allow ourselves to disturb you as you can okay see. so we so, so i have was, okay well okay then, that's, then okay then we can go slowly and and you can keep asking all the questions that you have right. and that yeah, that's probably better anyway <laughs> if you can ask all the questions um all right so um so suppose so now uh, consider finite dimensional epsilon representations of the group S, L, N, Z, right? And N is at least three. So maybe we just fix it to be three. Doesn't really matter. And so this group has uh, as you all know an important subgroup, which is uh, uh, the group of um, like unipotent matrices with, with two uh, entries, like I indicated. So that's a copy of Z square. That's a subgroup of SL, let's say three Z. And whenever you have an epsilon representation of SL three Z, you can also restrict it to the subgroup and see what happens on the subgroup. And, and uh, I guess Michael has used exactly this technique last week. So maybe you're, you're familiar with this approach. So uh, consider, um, so that uh, pi from SL3Z to UK, so K is now a fixed finite number, B uh, and epsilon, representation uh, in the uniform sense as above. Um, and consider uh, the restriction of pi to this copy z square. So that's now a map from z square to u um, of k. And what do we know about this representation? Well, what? Uh, well, it's now an, an epsilon representation still. So pi restricted to z square is still an epsilon representation. And because z square is amenable, um, we get that pi restricted to z square is is close. To, and I will write a, a little a twiddle to um, uh, indicate that something is uniformly close, right? Um, so that makes it 
easy to, to ignore all the quantitative problems, so all the epsilon, two epsilon, whatever epsilon. So I'm just writing close in that sense. And then um, somehow to get the final statement, maybe you have to adjust your epsilon in, in some sense to, uh, uh, to get the precise result. So I'm just giving you the idea basically of the proof. So pi of z square is close to mu, where mu is actually a representation into, uh, into the unitary group um, UK, all right? And so what I claim is that, um, um, so how do you classify these representations of Z square? So they are given uh, by basically by K points uh, on the two torus, uh, if you want, right? You can diagonalize them and then each diagonal entry will give you a unitary one-dimensional representation of Z square. That's a point on the two torus. So you get like K points on the two torus. So the, the character, Uh, of mu is given by k points on the two-dimensional torus. And um, <clears throat> if you would have started with an actual representation of, uh, of SL3z, then these k points would have to be very specific because these k points as a Set with multiplicities is actually invariant under the action of SL um, of SL two Z, right? And that leaves only very limited number of possibilities. And what I want to prove is that even though we didn't start with an actual representation, this is still the case, right? Okay. So note there exists also this copy of SL two Z. Um, which is uh, um, as a subgroup of SL3Z, where you consider a matrix A uh, just as, uh, as a matrix of this form. And this SL2Z normalizes our copy of Z square and the natural action that is induced on, on Z square, if it's normalizing a group, it just acts by acts on it by conjugation. And the natural action that you get on Z square is the obvious action. You can check that. Um, well, and that's uh, that's exactly the reason why um, if you um, start out with a representation of, of this group SL3Z, then the restriction of that representation to Z square does actually in, in a very natural way come with, uh, comes with a bunch of, of unitaries acting on the same Hilbert space that implement um, all kinds of uh, uh, conjugations that give you still, uh, well, it doesn't give you the same representation. It gives you a conjugate representation, but it gives you a representation with the same character. And that means that this character, this this uh, collection of k points on the two-dimensional torus, that this this is actually invariant under the under the action of SL2Z, and so the same argument, not quite the same argument, works uh, for the representation mu. Um, but we can we can now argue as follows. So consider. the representation mu upper G um, of uh, um, L. And this is defined to be mu of G times L for G is in SL2Z and L is in Z square, right? So you, you just rotate your representation by an automorphism, we basically precompose by an automorphism of Z square by an element in SL2Z. And so, um, okay, so we start out with our representation mu G. Um, and this mu G is uh, still epsilon close to, um, so let me uh, do this 
precisely, not that I confuse something. What it's epsilon close. Um, so let me write this L here, right? So this is uh, close to pi G of L, which is defined in exactly the same way. So how is it defined? So that's it's defined if you now write it in terms of, of the representation uh, um, of the epsilon representation, this is this element, right? So because the, the action of G on Z square is implemented by conjugation, right? So you do this G, it acts, it acts actually by conjugation. And so since pi is an epsilon homomorphism, this is actually, this is now close to pi G pi L pi of G uh, star. And pi was close to mu. So this is close to pi G mu of L pi G uh, star, right? And what you see from this whole computation is that this representation mu g, so the conjugate of mu by g is close to a conjugate of the representation mu. All right, so that's what the computation gives you. So it was, uh, had to be very careful because pi, which we used in the middle was only an epsilon representation. And so that means, that by, by the result of Johnson on deformation rigidity, it means that mu of, uh, that mu of G is conjugate uh, to pi of G mu pi of G star and uh, hence conjugate to mu, right? And that gives that the character of mu is uh, is invariant. Sorry, I removed this. Is invariant under the action of SL two Z. Right. So G was an element in SL two Z, and so we have proven mu of G is conjugate to mu. So they have the same character. And the character hence must be invariant under the action of SL2Z. So the character, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about this point set on the two torus as the set is now invariant. And so, <clears throat> so what that means is, um, so looking at the possibilities, at possible such sets, we get, that there exists, um, um, so how do you argue exactly? Um, so you conclude that there exists a Q um, um, So it means that all the points on the two torus that you are using for this set of K elements they must all, all be um, torsion points with one fixed denominator. So that's basically the conclusion. And being torsion points with one fixed denominator, this in particular means that if you if you apply uh, a multiple of that denominator, then each of these characters is trivialized. So what it means is there exists um, a Q, uh, some integer not zero, such that, um, for example, mu of the vector um, of Q zero is equal to the identity, right? So you have, so that maybe was a little bit sketchy, but it's, um, that's, that's how we use it, right? And is there a question? Yeah, what do you mean by, by Q? 
U of Q zero are just, just mean that the elements, all the elements yes. of order Q, right, in the image of Z square. Ah, okay, that's what you mean. That's it. an element in Z square, exactly. Um, <clears throat> all right, and now, um, so that's 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 one um, element on which mu is trivial, and hence pi of this same element, um, well, is close to the identity, right? It's maybe not epsilon close, but maybe 16 epsilon close if you followed the entire proof. So pi is trivial on one element like this. And now comes the point where Alex uh, was probably thinking that this is an interesting application of uh, bounded generation. There's a theorem. And um, so um, let me give the completely correct. Um, I don't know if maybe it was known before by um, in uh, for other rings, but I mean, let me. Uh, so I, I learned it from Witte Morris paper, <laughs> and in this situation, it says um, there exists um, a number r, which let's say it also depends on n, but I mean we restricted everything also to. I mean, we, we are now only looking at SL, SL3Z, right? So that's, uh, so there exists a number R such that um, the normal subgroup generated by Q comma zero uh, is contained or is actually equal to the union of, um, I, I take this notation for the uh, for the conjugacy class. So I take, uh, and now you take the um, j's power j equal from zero to r. Right. So in general, if you <coughs> want to. Uh, describe the normal subgroup uh, generated by an element. I mean, first of all, you also have to take the inverse into account. That is not a, not a big problem in that situation. But more importantly, you typically have to take arbitrarily long products of conjugates of a particular element, right? There's no reason why you can stop at a particular, um, at a particular uh, number of factors. And that's uh, exactly the point in that theorem that for this particular group SL3Z, there's a very uniform way in which such a specific element generates its normal subgroup, the normal subgroup it generates. And this uh, um, uniform way, I mean, it's exactly expressed in the theorem, there exists a uniform number R so that whatever it generates as a normal subgroup is generated after R steps. Is it clear? Yes. Yeah, I, I just want to, to mention for uh, some of the people, uh, 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 we call it uh, in, the, in the lectures of uh, Nir Avni and Ken Meiri, this was called the width of the conjugacy class is finite in this number yes. R, namely every element which is in the normal closure of the subgroup generated by the conjugacy class can be written as a product of R conjugates. Of yes. the, of the and so I have a question for you because you have had already a lot of talks about that. Is that true for any conjugacy class in SL3Z? Is that known? Yes, yes. In, okay. SL, in SLNZ, it's known for every conjugacy okay. class. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I, the, I mean, now, I, now, what I don't remember if, if they are depends or independent like yeah oh, I, I, that, that was my question is is r independent is it is this the same r for all the conjugacy classes so i think i can i had the idea to prove it but i, I somehow thought that must be a very natural question so maybe I think, so. I think it is known from the paper of witty morris of the slnz but let me just yeah, yeah for, SL, for slnz and greater than three i think it's known uh, okay 
that it depends only on uh, only on the n, like S L N Z yeah, only on n, not, some number not, yeah. universal. All right, but, but just I want to stress because you know uh, during this seminar we speculated a few times that this bounded generation by conjugacy classes is maybe the right replacement to bounded generation by cyclic groups. Like uh, uh, Nir and Chen show that it implies the congruence of property, and the uh, Rappinschuk showed us that uh, the, the classical bounded generation does not hold in the co-compact lattices. So yeah. it raised some hope that this will be the property. I want to stress that for co-compact lattices, you cannot expect this mm -hmm. R to be independent of the, of the conjugacy class. And there is a very simple argument for that. It's because you can embed your group as a dense subgroup of a compactly group and then you can choose elements which are very, very, very close to the identity uh -huh. in the in this Archimedean topology. So you cannot expect that they generate uh, fast, too fast. The, the I see. All right. So um, so let me just finish the proof. So that's uh, a second thing which was uh, which was known. Uh, I don't exactly, that's that's a much older result, is that this is actually finite index. So you know that uh, that very well. But the index, of course, depends on Q. So it's, um, okay. So the R is uniform, but the Q, I mean, the index is, of course, not uniform. So the R is uniform, but the index is not uniform. Anyway, so what we are getting from this is that pi Right, so we know that that this uh, element is mapped close to the identity, but now what I'm claiming is that pi of g is also close to the identity uh, for all g in this normal subgroup. And uh, if let's say if this if this was um, epsilon close up here, then this is r times epsilon close. Right, because you need R conjugates of that element to to write it as a product of the conjugates of of, of Q uh, comma zero. Right, but still, if you can choose uh, if you can choose this epsilon before, then then you can make it just a little bit smaller, so that after multiplication with R with R, it's still small. Right, so it's all right, and so now. Um, to finish the proof, you have this SL3Z. It maps to SL3Z modulo the normal subgroup generated by Q0. And choosing a splitting, right? So this is the natural projection, but you can choose some splitting uh, sigma. So that just um, takes some pre image of, uh, of pi. And then here you have your, your representation. Okay, so maybe we shouldn't call that pi, we should call it alpha, because pi is already taken. That's your, um, your, um, your epsilon representation. And what you are now considering is this composition. So you consider pi composed with sigma. And from the property that uh, I, have, I have written up here, it's not complicated to check that this is, uh, is also in, um, in probably something like three times R times epsilon representation, right? Because you make some mistakes um, because the, the kernel of the homomorphism is, well, is what it is and it's mapped to non-trivial unitaries, but never too far away from the identity. So if this was an epsilon representation here, this, this map pi comma sigma is now still some sort of epsilon presentation only with a different epsilon with three times r times epsilon but now what helps us is that this group this quotient group is finite so in particular it's amenable so we can actually find a representation uh call it mu prime uh an actual representation which is which is close to pi composed with sigma and so if you take all that together, then 
pi is close to pi composed with sigma, and this is close to mu prime. So you have shown that pi is close to a representation. And that's the, that's the idea of the proof. So I think that was um, maybe a little bit fast, but I, I think at the key point, at least, I hope it became apparent that we used this bounded generation in a crucial way. And we, we also, in a crucial way, we used the uniformity of it, right? We used that R is uniform for all Q, it is the same because we didn't know how large is Q. I mean, maybe depending on K, we could have said something, but we wanted also K to be uh, arbitrary, right? So we couldn't bound Q, but from the theorem, we could bound R. And that was actually enough because the statements for amenable groups, they were kind of uniform. Right? We applied it only to finite groups, but it's the uniformity in that case implied that it, for example, our bounds didn't depend on the on the size of the finite group, which would again be something that we couldn't control. Okay, so that was, so the source of uniformity really came from that CRM, uh, which we used as a black box in some sense. All right, so I hope I'm, I explained the key features of the proof. Um, thank you for your attention. In, in your original paper, you used this Johnson theorem. I, I, I got something which I don't remember. I mean, I haven't looked at it for a while, but uh... well, we gave it, we gave a generalization of Johnson's result for unitarizable groups, and the proof is in the end not all that complicated. So I, I basically explained the proof. Uh, it's taking the fixed point in this convex set, and that's essentially this intertwiner between pi and mu. Uh, but you could have cited Johnson uh, if you don't want to reprove that, or you could look at our paper where we proved the same thing for unitarizable groups, which is slightly, I mean, potentially more general. So basically, what, what the property which are needed here are that the group is uh, boundedly generated by a minimal groups, but in a way which is that the bound is independent of the choice, all right? And the quotient is also amenable, right? That, that's really what you need here. Yeah, yes. Yeah, you can probably formulate an abstract property, but then yeah. how to come up with more examples, I guess. It's an opportunity for me to mention that that's an excellent introduction for the lecture of next week. Because next week, and uh, in, in fact, uh, in, in the next two weeks, Bharat and Garajan will show us a technique that can apply to get results like that of Ulam stability when, when you don't have this kind of a bounded generation. What uh, replaces this technique is, is a kind of a homological method, which is in a way behind the, met the original method of Kashdan for amenable group, um, somehow related to bounded cohomology instead of bounded generation. So uh, because it's a little bit more complicated, it will give two talks in the first talk we will set up slowly the machinery, which involves a little bit of uh, ultra product, a little bit of non-standard analysis and things like that. And in the week after that, we will uh, do the application to get a similar result by completely different method. Um, so this is kind of a preview for, next, for the next two weeks. Uh, any remarks, questions from the people maybe, here? Maybe. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, I have a question. So, uh, yeah, thanks for the uh, talk. And uh, just uh, curious about one thing. So you prove that this SLNZ and at least the three uh, to be uh, almost uh, stable. So suppose you have an absolute representation. Uh, can you construct uh, a representation which is close to this absolute representation? 
explicitly. Huh. I mean, the question is how explicit is your epsilon representation? So you have it, you want, want like a- uh, Yeah, just wondering, I mean, we know that this is a stable, right? But uh, suppose this is a closed door representation. Can you find us such a representation? So yeah, that's my question. Yeah, I'm not sure how exactly to answer this. Um, I mean, the proof gives kind of an algorithm how to do it, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether whether you can put it on a computer because the input is already infinite amount of data because you have all the infinitely many images of your epsilon representation. So one has to, uh, but I think it's a good question. So, I mean, one just has to make maybe a bit more precise. What is, what is the input? What is the output? And is that a computable function? I think probably yes in the right framework. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Um, Maybe I could also ask a short question. So looking at this proof, um, I felt it was natural to ask, what happens if you look at um, almost rep epsilon representations of SO3Z, not in finite dimensions, but inside the tracial von Neumann algebra? Somehow the proof, I was very much reminded by this proof of Becker for yes. character rigidity, kind of, reducing to this congruence quotients and um, uh, that's an excellent question so you you have uh, an epsilon have representation norm. maybe you have to take the trace norm instead of the uniform norm but now somehow what what I felt played a central role in your proof is this character right which you can yes. uh -huh. still define uh, I was wondering if you maybe like. So yeah, I have the feeling all. that I thought about that question before, but I cannot answer it. I'm I'm really sorry. So it, no uh, problem. I missed something. Of course, I mean the, the only problem. way this character can be can be SL two invariant without being atomic is that it's right. actually the uniform measure on the two torus, and that's mm. also a very natural representation. In the, so maybe. Uh, that would lead to the left to the to the standard representation of SL3Z in, into its Coupe von Neumann algebra, but uh, I don't don't recall exactly what what happens in this case. Right. Thank you. Okay. Any other question? If not. Well, let's thank, we are just on time to thank uh, Andreas again. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. See you next week. Thank you. Same time, same place. Yep, yeah. see you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much, everybody. Thank you. This was a wonderful talk. Say thank you, Andreas. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. You're back. Yeah. Actually, I have it one for those from the sign that was illegal to the fortune of the sign that was sent by the sign that was sent by the Yeah, I'm not sure, but it's better than expected. Yeah, that was, that's actually the, the, the list. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>